Parathyroid hormone is the main hormone that controls blood calcium levels. And it works on the bone, the kidney, as well as the intestine. So if the blood has low blood calcium, hypocalcemia, there's a release of parathyroid hormone or parathormone from the parathyroid glands. When it acts on the blood, which is its primary source of calcium, it activates osteoclast activity in the bone, which causes the calciums and the phosphates to be broken down, released out of the blood. The osteoclast breaks down the bone matrix. When it works on the kidney, it causes reabsorption of kidney tubule or reabsorption of the calcium in the kidney tubules. And for the intestines, it activates vitamin D by the kidney, thus increasing calcium absorption from the food in the small intestine. So we know the calcium is extremely important in the body. These are some of the reasons it's so important. And in the case of hypocalcemia, when there's low blood calcium, this could cause increased neuromuscular excitability and calcium uh, muscle tetany. In this case, the calcium is in the cells instead of in the blood. In the opposite scenario, in hypercalcemia, there's too much calcium in the blood, but very little in the cells. This can inhibit the normal activities that calcium is responsible for. So it could inhibit neurons and muscle cells, and it could cause heart arrhythmias. So anions are also extremely important with electrolytes. The most important anion is calcium or chloride, which is covered calcium. The most important is chloride, and it accompanies sodium in the extracellular fluid. The majority of it is going to be reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. It follows sodium in the PCT. And when acidosis occurs, there are fewer chloride ions that are reabsorbed in place of bicarbonate. In regards to acid-base balance, it's extremely important that the pH range in the blood stays within 7.35 to 7.45. If it's greater than 7.45 in the arterial blood, the condition of alkalosis or alkalemia occurs. In the case of acidosis, the arterial pH is less than 7.35. And small amounts of these acidic substances can enter the body and the food, but most of it is produced as a byproduct of metabolism. A couple examples are lactic acid from the anaerobic breakdown of glucose, and fatty acids and ketones from fat metabolism. When protons or hydrogen, when they're liber liberated, they're released when the CO2 is converted to the bicarbonate in the blood. So acid-base balance, it's controlled by three primary mechanisms. The first of which is in the blood, it's the chemical buffer systems, this is the rapid first line of defense. The second is with the medulla, the brain stem, the respiratory centers act within one to three minutes. So there would be uh, receptors involved here. And then finally, the most potent, but which takes longer, is the renal mechanisms. So the chemical buffer systems, there are three examples. The main one is called the bicarbonate buffer system, the phosphate buffer system, and the protein buffer system. And a buffer system, it's a system of one or more compounds, usually with an acid and a base, and its job is to bind up hydrogen if the pH drops, or release hydrogen if the pH rises. So um, pH the measurement of pH is the free hydrogen or proton that's in solution, the concentration of that. So 
Our next slide here shows examples of a strong and a weak acid. A strong acid means that it dissociates or breaks apart completely into its ions. In this case, we see hydrochloric acid breaking apart completely into hydrogen and the anion chloride. The weak acid, it breaks apart, but not as specifically. And in this case, it breaks apart into hydrogen and bicarbonate but not all of the hydrogen is liberated, as is the case in a strong acid. So again, hydrogen, the concentration of it, is the main substance responsible for affecting the pH of those body fluids. So this is a summary of the chemical buffer systems. So the bicarbonate buffer system is a combination of a weak acid, which we just saw in the last slide, and a salt, which is a weak base, the bicarbonate, and it's the main extracellular fluid buffer. The phosphate buffer system is a combination of a weak acid as well as a weak base, and the protein buffer system, it is going to contain a weak acid which contains this part of a molecule and also a weak base which contains an amine group part of amino acids. So the respiratory regulation of hydrogen occurs basically because of a reversible equilibrium reaction that exists in the blood and it's carbon dioxide plus water they can be converted into bicarb or um, carbonic acid and that can then be released into hydrogen and bicarbonate, which a lot of people just say bicarb. So in the case of carbon dioxide unloading, the reaction is going to shift to the left and hydrogen would be incorporated into the water but during carbon dioxide loading the reaction shifts to the right and hydrogen is buffered by proteins. In the case of hypercapnia, hypercapnia occurs if the carbon dioxide rises. This is going to activate the medullary chemoreceptors and that increases the respiratory rate and the depth which would be hyperventilation. So it triggers hyperventilation is the result of that. So when carbon dioxide increases, hydrogen also increases. In the case of acidosis, the acidosis would then, um, it would activate those peripheral chemoreceptors as well. And this causes the increased respiratory rate and depth. So the two different examples that you should be aware of are hypoventilation and hyperventilation. Hypoventilation, it causes respiratory acidosis. The examples of this, uh, the main example would be narcotics or opiates causing this. It's going to lower the respiratory rate. Also, it's associated with um, impaired gas exchange and so there needs to be some sort of correction in this case. In the example of hyperventilation, that causes respiratory alkalosis. So alkalosis is a high pH, but a low amount of hydrogen. And the classic example, this is a panic attack. In this case, carbon dioxide is eliminated from the body faster than produced. So the CO2 is going down and deeper and faster breathing than normal, it eliminates the CO2. So breathing in a brown paper bag is a classic way to um, respond for a patient to respond to the hyperventilation or an anxiety attack. 